My name is Philippa Frame and I'm the Research Data Librarian in the Office for Scholarly Communication in the Library at QUT. So before we begin today's session, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. QUT acknowledges the Turrbal and Yugara as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands. We pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. We recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. And QUT acknowledges the important role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, as they play within our QUT community. So welcome everyone. We have a, a full program today. Um, so let's begin. Uh, as a result of COVID-19, the scholarly communication landscape has changed drastically to open up research to wider communities. Open Access Week is a time for the research community to consider how they can re ensure research data outputs are available to all. This year's Open Access Week theme is Open with Purpose, taking action to build structural equity and inclusion. During today's session, you'll be hearing from several QT researchers and advocates for open access on their experiences working with uh, open data sets. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today. We have Paula Callan, Scholarly Communications Librarian in the Office for Scholarly Communication at QT Library. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm just going to set the scene by introducing um, uh, some of the ideas that will be covered in this session. So some of the key principles that underpin open research. Okay, I'll start with uh, defining open access um, and focusing on uh, um, the key elements. So uh, open access is the free online availability of research outputs with a reuse license. And the key element in this is the reuse license because that differentiates outputs that are simply freely available online from outputs that are genuinely open access. And of course, open research exists within um, a, an environment and the emerging research ecosystem is one in which so many of the tools that we're using are, um, have openness at its core. And the slide here um, is one of Ginny's slides, but it, it actually shows some of the recent innovations in scholarly communication. So some of the tools that we're using that as they are all related to openness. So that includes the preprint servers and many of the other um, data driven tools are open source. And in terms of the characteristics and indicators of open access research, um, it's really the meeting of open research data, um, open access publications, and open scholarly communication tools. So that would include funder policies on data sharing, data repositories, and importantly, researcher attitudes to sharing their data, uh, open source software, open notebooks, um, open peer review, open uh, metrics for assessing research um, and uh, enabling citizen science projects, uh, networks, so social research networks, and then of course, all of the aspects of open access publications, including the open access journals and the policies that are underpinning this move towards open access. In terms of data, then we really need to introduce the FAIR data principles. So FAIR standing for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And so by that we mean data that has supplementary materials with sufficiently rich metadata and identify it. So they're one of the key elements. Uh, by interoperable, we mean that they're using uh, uh, the standard languages for representing the information and are interoperable in terms of machine to machine um, readability and sharing. And, um, and again, with the accessible, not only open and available uh, to people to download, but again, the interoperable, uh, accessible to, to machines as well. And reusable, this is where we're, the key is that reuse license, so people know what they can and cannot do with the, the data. Unpacking that a little more, um, this slide, which is EC, I think this is the uh, EC, 
uh, European Commission. It unpacks the FAIR principles in terms of the application to research outputs, the potential use cases, and what does that mean in terms of actions? What do researchers need to be doing to make their research data FAIR? And I know it's a lot of information on the slide, but there is a link there to this handout. And finally, why is it important? Well, I'm tying that back to the Open Access Week um, theme this year, which is open with purpose, taking action to build structural and equity and inclusion. Um, FAIR is a fundamental enabler, and open access research is a pathway to equity and inclusion um, globally. So I will leave it there and I will pass over to back to Philippa. All right, thank you very much, Paula. Yeah, Sam, you're up next. Are you happy to go? Yep, okay, over to Sam. Sam Hames is a software developer, data scientist within the Di Australian Digital Observatory uh, within our Institute for Future Environments at QUT. Thanks, Sam. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, so I'm a software developer. I'm with the, in, in the Digital Observatory. So we are a research infrastructure team we look after uh, collection, analysis, manipulation of social media data. Uh, and we are, although we're currently part of IFE, we will, in the proposed new structure, we will be part of the central research infrastructure team. Um, so the main, major thing we do, obviously, is uh, social media data. Um, in particular, the biggest thing we look after is uh, a longitudinal Twitter data collection called the Australian Twitter Sphere. In that collection, we're, we're tracking uh, more than half a million accounts identified it as Australian, and we've been tracking them continuously for more than two years now. Um, so we're currently collecting around 700,000 tweets per day or 20 million tweets per month from all of those accounts. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, a particular challenge that is relevant to everybody, which is uh, the online discussion around COVID and the ongoing challenges that faces, uh, or the, ongoing challenges that presents us. So particularly in the context of our domain. Um, so if we, if you wanna study coronavirus discussion on social media, it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, you will find lots and you can certainly start collecting data yourself. Uh, that will give you a narrow, sorry, you, uh, through Twitter specifically, it's very easy to get data from the last seven days. You can get some data, you, it may not be comprehensive. Uh, or you can use existing collections such as this one, which is uh, 650 million tweets currently. Um, so you end up with a case where everything is either too general to be useful, like you're trying to filter down from 700 million tweets, give or take, or uh, too specific to be useful. So it may be something like geolocated tweets from the state of New York, which is not going to be relevant for everybody. The other, so these data sets will look, you, let you look back into the past, but you have a lot of work to do to turn them into something useful. Another thing to consider is that uh, the topics of conversation shift over time. So even if you're talking about coronavirus, what pe the words people were using or the way people were talking about it in February is very different to the way they're talking about it now. In February, everybody was talking about uh, China and Wuhan and maybe the early phases of discussion around Italy. Uh, if you're talking about it now, it might be the US, Brazil, uh, the US presidential elections, everything mixed in together. So really what we wanted to do was to take the data set we have, which is the Australian Twitter sphere, and we wanted to curate it into something that is actually useful for a national level analysis of coronavirus discussion. Uh, so we, the original concept for this, which kind of kicked all of this discussion, which is going to lead into the data set discussions I'll talk about in a, a little bit later, is uh, we wanted to prepare a, a, an overview to, an overview visualization in conjunction with Visa, the Visa team uh, to kind of look at and understand the conversation, the early conversations around coronavirus. So the concept for this was that we wanted to look at the first 100 days of COVID in Australia and the conversation online around that. So uh, that's more or less uh, middle of January to the end of April. Um, obviously, this seems very quaint now that we're in October, that we only went for 100 days, but life does that to you. So this visualization is kind of the, the top level. So based on some analytical work that Dan Angus did from the DMRC, uh, we, we 
and Alice Miller from our team, we we broke down the Austra we we tried to identify the broad conversations and themes in the Australian Twitter sphere. So what what is characterizing the different phases of conversation and how do they change over time? Um, so for example, some of the top level stuff, we look at geography. Uh, very early on, a lot of the discussion is about China. And then as it goes on and we start to have a, an uptick in local cases and local transmission, suddenly it's all very local. Um, so it seems very distant in January. Then we hit cases happening here and the conversation is shifted about what are we doing in Australia. So, so based on that analytical work, we kind of had a curated set of phrases and keywords that let us pick out what is the actual content on Twitter describing coronavirus for 100 days. So we, we had that curated data set. What we actually wanted to do, though, is obviously like a high level visualization like this is nice for exploration. But if you're a researcher, you really want to drive down into the, the raw tweets. You want to look at the raw conversation. You want the detailed information. Uh, so for social media data, that is a real challenge. Like there, there are many, many issues with it is very difficult to do genuinely ethical and appropriate uh, open access data for social media. But there are some things we can do. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this uh, discussion today. So just to give you an idea, the, the data underlying this visualization was 2.8 million tweets. So we have plenty of um, uh, so we have plenty of tweets. So the there were three main things we needed to consider. The first was uh, what are the platform terms of service? Because uh, we don't really want to deal with a legal threat from Twitter related to the data we're sharing. The second thing we needed to consider was how do we approach copyright? And the third thing was how do we respect the agencies of users over their own content, which is a major ethical consideration. Going through all of the steps we needed to take, and I have to uh, put in a big shout out for the library, uh, particular cut. Katya, uh, who helped us a lot with working out the copyright issues. We ended up publishing uh, through QT's research data finder a set of the tweet ID identifiers. So these are just a numerical identifier to the content on Twitter. If you have a Twitter API account, you can use this data set to retrieve the full tweets. So this respects the platform's terms of service. It means you won't retrieve tweets that have been deleted since we analyzed them. And it allow allows us to share all of the content underneath it while respecting all of those issues. So if you search for COVID in the research data finder, you'll find us, you'll find our data set, you'll find that has a citable DOI. Um, and if you want to, you can download the raw tweet ID data and rehydrate it yourself and turn that into a, a full set of data for that collection. Obviously, it would be nice if we could share the full data openly, but that is a very, it would, it's, it's very difficult to do so. And we would like in the future to be able to do more work around uh, characterizing the content of the data so that if you, for example, see that there's 25% of the tweets are deleted, you'd be able to have some understanding of which were those tweets relevant to your data set or have, have like all of the controversial things people uh, that you were interested in being deleted or is it something else or is, are they just missing at random? So just to close off, I'd like to give a, a Obviously, we're going to have question time right after this, but if you want to discuss more, you can email us at digitalobservatory at qt.edu.au, or you can come along to Hacky Hour. Uh, there is always one of our team members there. Uh, it's on every week, 2 to 3 p.m. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Sam. Any questions for Sam? Oh, Ginny, yes. Yeah. Hi, so thanks, Sam. That's great to see that. I think it's such a fabulous resource. So just out of curiosity, what would be the kind of things that you would have changed or done differently had you kind of were doing it now? As you said, you intimated that you'd maybe gone for longer than 100 days, but... Uh... Ah, yes, yes. The, the, yes, uh, that's a really good question. I think... Um, so one thing I, I definitely think we should be doing in future is looking at publishing summary statistics that help characterize the data set. So like if you know that at the time we released the data set, there were a thousand, hash, a thousand tweets containing a particular hashtag, and then you retrieve the tweets and all of them are suddenly missing, you know that there's something going on. Um, you, you may not be able to figure out exactly what, but you know that there's an issue there that over overhangs your analysis and can't be avoided. Um, the other thing, oh yeah, I, I guess it would have been nice if we'd planned for this collection and release to kind of continue and be done periodically, because obviously I think we're 
I, we were all a bit more optimistic about where we would be with respect to the pandemic now that it's October. Um, obviously, we're also missing like all of the Melbourne discussion. So I, I think the, the short version is for these kind of dynamic ongoing processes. I think we should have, it would have been better if we had planned to be releasing and refreshing over time. But obviously, it's hard to commit to ongoing work. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Betsy, who works with Sam, has commented in the chat to say that the 100 days was chosen at the beginning as it's a common time period for studying diseases. Thanks, Betsy. Any other questions for Sam? Okay, we might move back to Roberto. Are you ready to go, Roberto? Yes, thank you, Philippa. Thank you, everyone, for being so flexible. Um, to begin with, uh, thank you to the committee for inviting me to celebrate with you the Open Access Week uh, 2020. Um, really keen to draw um, and shout out to the foundational databases in life sciences. Um, they are the pioneers of uh, collecting uh, genetic data uh, and making it available to our community over the last 30, 35 years. So um, I'd like to, to bring us a bit back in time, about uh, three, four billion years ago, uh, when the first living organism uh, uh, is suggested, estimated, that has uh, appeared on our planet. Um, so three, four billion years ago, um, we had uh, very simple organisms uh, that evolved their capacity to produce oxygen. And as we can uh, I see the impact of that is that it generated uh, oxygen that allow many other species to evolve on our planet. Um, a study um, released in 2011 suggested that currently nowadays we share our planet with another 8.7 billion species uh, and it estimated that perhaps will take us a thousand years to catalog all these species. We only know a small fraction of those species and mainly those ones living on land, not marine species. And if it is going to take us that long, it may possibly uh, occur that many of these species will go extinct in that time. So just reflecting back on the series of the Jurassic Park, we need an amber uh, to document and collect that information and preserve the genetic data of the species that we share the planet with. Um, just a couple of slides on bringing to you some of the key milestones that uh, researchers have achieved in terms of uh, uh, pursuing their uh, interest and curiosity to understand uh, living organisms, living species. So uh, around 160 years ago, uh, Charles Darwin certainly proposed how a species are evolving or how uh, genetic features can be passed down the generations or how we can move genetic elements from one organism to another to confer new uh, properties. But the major milestone in terms of uh, accumulating the knowledge of the DNA uh, blueprint of life is in 1953 with the work of Watson and Crick and certainly uh, Rosalind Franklin that play a major role. It was until 1977 when uh, it was invented the first method for sequencing and the different uh, genetic information, DNA particularly. And since then, um, we have been in, in a um, very dynamic field that in the, uh, in the 1990s, mid 1990s, it started with the first sequencing of the first bacterial genome, followed by many other species, including uh, celebrating the 50 year anniversary of the paper published by Watson and Crick, uh, the first complete uh, uh, genome of the human. So um, shortly after uh, the completion of this major milestone, and knowing that at that time it cost roughly $100 million to sequence one human genome, certainly was really necessary to have a major technological advance. Um, the, the first generation of uh, new technologies that appear in, back in 2005, 2007, and now we are down to the third generation of these have uh, certainly accelerated the accumulation of this genetic information from a wide range of species. But we need to acknowledge who is the pioneer in the region of public databases, and that goes to the work of Margaret Oakley uh, Dayhoff uh, in the early uh, 80s. 1980s, 
Her work uh, consisted in uh, uh, putting together a database that collected uh, uh, what they call peptides, uh, which are uh, smaller fragments of proteins, and that her work was a pioneer to lead to the uh, foundational uh, genetic databases. There are three of them that uh, were created within a decade since the invention of the method for sequencing uh, DNA, and those are NCBI, DDBJ, and EMBL. Um, this form a coalition that stands until today. Uh, they, their mission is to store and share all public genetic information for all living organisms. They are synchronized in terms of the information they contain, except for the last 24 hours uh, that would take for them uh, to, uh, to capture and share the latest submissions. So as you can imagine, uh, with the uh, innovation of new technologies, uh, it has been certainly accelerated the rate in which uh, information is being accumulated. Um, just in, in a period of five years, we, uh, we generated more than 90% of the information that currently our public databases stores. We are on track to have uh, a, a petabyte of public data and to put into context, that's equivalent to 20 million four drawer cabinet, filing cabinets, or having enough high definition TV shows for 13 years. And um, at QT, we currently have capacity for 1.8 petabytes of data storage. Uh, this data storage is not only this capacity of, of this space that we have, it's allocated to a combination of, uh, of activities being data storage, data processing, and as well data analysis. It seems to be that my slide is a bit distorted in the corner. So as you can imagine, with the accumulation of this large amount of data, uh, it certainly creates many new opportunities for research worldwide. Uh, we have plenty of data that is available in public databases, but now the challenge is to make sense and, and discern uh, what is a minimal, uh, a min, uh, meaningful information. So how can we go from the observation that we observe one letter change in our genetic code to associate possibly with a disease? Uh, nowadays, these foundational databases and other third-party databases have provided to us many layers of information that can allow us to uh, link from that genetic change that we can observe down to the disease and also how the environment may play a role in this uh, association. Just to draw your attention to public databases, um, as in any other activity, it, they can be polluted with low quality data. So it's really important for us uh, to ensure that we uh, move forward to utilize and optimize uh, data analytics that uh, generate meaningful data that can be shared in public databases. As Paul already shared, fair principles, certainly. And we're looking at end-to-end -end analytical workflows. And as you've seen, uh, we have a very large amount of the first species on our planet. Uh, likewise, when we look at uh, using analytical tools for different species, we need to benchmark which of those uh, open source tools that we have available is, is suitable for the data analysis. There's not a single tool that we can apply to all species. The other aspect of this important we work in towards is to harmonization of the best practices and standards with domain experts uh, to make sure we have reproducible end-to-end uh, -end analytical workflows that are also secure, given that nowadays we are looking at utilizing uh, sensitive data such as clinical information. Importantly, it is important to allow our community uh, to run their analysis in an scalable manner and and another aspect that we encourage is validation of the discoveries uh, that we find from this um, analysis of the data. And importantly, celebrating this week, certainly sharing both the raw data and also meaningful process outputs are important to advance science. Um, 
Over the last few years, we've also uh, shared some of these resources into the public databases, and, and this is one of the activities where we contributed to the assembly of the barley genome. And barley is important for Australia. It's, it's an industry that accounts for roughly 800 million to a billion dollar activity annually. And it is important that we provide uh, the blueprint of the genome to accelerate uh, breeding programs. Another um, species where we contributed the uh, genome resource is the cattle tick that impacted dairy and beef industries in Australia, causing $140 million losses a year. So they're really itching to have a new vaccine that can confer protection. So we've uh, identified some candidates that can allow that R&D activity. And currently, just to share a couple of activities with you, uh, we are involved in partnership with the Department of Agriculture, Water Resources and Horticultural Industries, uh, collaborating uh, um, with the industries to accelerate quarantine testing at the border. Um, just to put it into context, if you go overseas, you buy presents for your family, when you come back to Australia, when we are allowed to do so, uh, you have to leave your presents at the airport um, for three years. So you're not allowed to give those presents to your family for three years. So at the moment, our industries are experiencing that, depending on the plant species we're talking to. Some of them, they need to wait two to three years before the plant material that they bring to Australia are released from quarantine. We work in partnership with uh, our colleagues from the Department of Agriculture to accelerate this process. And we're looking to bring down this quarantine testing to six to 12 months and we'll be certainly generating a large amount of data over the next couple of years. There are other activities that uh, um, relate to all of us, and certainly plastic waste is a major issue globally. It is estimated that 8, bi uh, eight billion tons of plastics reach the oceans every year, so we need a solution to recycle. We recycle only a small amount of plastic, and this is mainly due to the fact that we are not able to recycle mix plastics. We're working in partnership with uh, researchers at CEF uh, to uh, uh, develop a, a combination, a solution of enzymatic enzymes from bacteria that grow in, in the great uh, Australian great artisan basin and that they have evolved this capacity uh, to use uh, hydrocarbons uh, over, the, over, the, uh, over time to identify uh, bacterial species that can allow us in this activity. And to finalize, um, as part of the e-research office, we are really keen to uh, facilitate data access acuity. Um, as I mentioned, um, it is important for us to, uh, to provide resources to store, process, and analyze data. And uh, we are working with uh, researchers at QUT to provide them uh, not only data analytics, but also access to a data warehouse that bring strategic uh, resources from key external databases. In the first round, we're looking at uptaking 200 ter terabytes of data uh, that will be applicable to uh, medical studies. With that, I would like to thank you. Any questions for Roberto? Um, Roberto, you talked about the data warehouse and making the contents available to QUT staff. How will we know what data sets are in the data warehouse? Um, yes, we are in the progress of defining um, standard operating procedures uh, that will allow us to uh, share with our community what data uh, is uh, currently host in this data warehouse. Um, there are some strategic um, data sets for medical applications and the, the current process is individual research groups need to uh, uh, produce applications to these data providers and we observe that um, different groups within our community are requesting access to the same data so we see there is duplication of the activity so we're hoping that we can minimize this duplication and facilitate access uh, for research. Thank you. And Ginny has a question in there too. Would you prefer to ask your question, Ginny, or shall I read it out for you? Uh, yeah, I, I can ask it. So I just want yeah. to write. Yeah, no, I was, my question really is that you know, obviously these are you know, fantastically complex data sets and they're incredibly interesting. But how do you kind of capture them for research? 
how do, how do public research publications, can they really reflect the richness of them? And what do you think the role of journal publications is, I guess, to describe these data sets? Um, good question. I'm not sure I, I fully understand the context of your question, but uh, I, I do agree from the point of view that uh, typically most of the research uh, would take an amount of effort and time uh, to undertake. And when you share and publish a, a manuscript, it will capture some of the highlights of the findings that uh, the research team has encountered over the journey of their research. And perhaps there are other components which are not captured. Generally, as a general principle, the main findings of interest for the research group are captured in those publications. But I do agree that perhaps the focus and interest of the research team um, might be potentially biased to a particular area of expertise. Hence, it is really important to make these data sets available and uh, allowed to be repurposed as other research teams may have a different lens to analyze the same data and have different findings. Great, thank you. And one last question for Roberto. Are there any any more questions? Okay, we might move on now to, uh, to Ginny. Um, so Professor Virginia Barber is co-lead QT Office for Scholarly Communication and she's also the director of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group. Uh, over to you, Ginny. Um, yeah, well, thanks very much for giving the chance to talk about this. So I'm, I'm absolutely not a data expert, but I, um, I spend a lot of time wading around in research publications. And so I, I want to just talk about something that I think is quite interesting that's happened in this sort of the pandemic is that how publications themselves become data sets and, and what that kind of means. Um, so, you know, this is a rather famous, actually openly licensed image from the CDC has kind of become the iconic one of the pandemic and it, it's changed many things obviously but it's actually also changed publishing really kind of probably forever I think. Um, we kind of knew at the beginning of the pandemic that we were probably going to know, need to know some things you know we're going to need to know about this this new coronavirus we'd need to about, know about the old one we probably thought you know because it was going to be a respiratory illness things like how to build ventilators might be important and face masks and goodness knows how many disinfectants we kind of had to learn about um, but then all sorts of other things became important so things that we hadn't thought about you know who thought that you know how things spread on cruise ships would have become terribly of great of interest you know the sort of practical research that people did things like developing drive-through pharmacies that was a kind of wasn't a thing until six months ago um, how you support athletes in lockdown and you know and how in fact one of what became really apparent was things like uh, very weird symptoms suddenly came to light loss of smell became important and so we, we're in a situation where um, it wasn't just the case that we needed access to the research that was obvious we needed access to the research that wasn't really obvious um, and all of a sudden we need kind of needed access to everything so I spent a lot of my time thinking about open access to research and so this really helped in a way thinking about um, you know the, the bigger picture as it were so kind of lots of things happened in the pandemic and this is a really great paper from a bioarchive which is a um, repository of preprints um, so those papers have not been peer-reviewed um, and it's a preprint of about a preprint so it's a bit of a kind of <laughs> Yeah, meta thing. And if any of you are on our the the talks that we organised earlier this week, Jessica Polka, who actually runs ASAP Bio, which is a um, organisation that advocates for preprints, talked about this paper, and she's one of the authors on it, in fact. And you can see a really nice timeline at the at the beginning, where it shows, um, you know, when the the time course of the of the pandemic um, and the papers that started to come out of it, and you've got preprints are in green. Uh, journal articles are in pink that's the second um, uh, panel down and then at the bottom all of it, the preprints are suddenly broken up into um, all the different types of uh, uh, places they could possibly be posted um, which include the the vast majority of which or the the, the sort of the biggest proportion, which actually not the vast majority, went to something called Med Archive, which was a really new um, preprint server that hadn't it was less than a year old at that point, and it went from having you know five or ten papers a day to sort of many hundreds of papers a day. So the the volume of publishing was just really quite astonishing. 
Um, so that was the first thing. The second thing that happened was their use kind of absolutely exploded. And this is a, a slide from the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation who um, put some money into BioArchive. It's actually from um, the, the images are from early this year. They're from from um, from um, spring really but even there you can see the publications were taking off their usage was taking off and a couple of days ago I looked at the actual numbers of publications that there are within um, both med archive and bioarchive which is kind of sister repository and there's more than you know 10,000 articles that are in there so this is in an astonishingly short space of time um, so what we've kind of sorry what we've kind of seen then is that all of a sudden, not just the, the publications, the individual publications became important, but how these publications were used and reused and how they were kind of collected together suddenly became a very important thing. Um, and, you know, bizarrely enough, one of the places that actually really understood this quite quickly was the US White House. In fact, their Office of Science and Technology Policy um, got together with um, an organization which uh, develops um, artificial intelligence and um, the National Library of Medicine in the US. And they, they put they basically developed this thing called the COVID-19 Open Research Dataset, COVID-19 Dataset, which um, uh, as of yesterday had 287,000 research papers in it and had been downloaded more than 25 million times. In fact, it's, I'm sure it's more than that now. And that's the entirety of that data set has been downloaded, not just um, the kind of individual papers. So there's an astonishing amount of usage of these papers. So first off, the, so the publications themselves have become data in, in, in their own right. And the second thing that's also happened is that, um, as well as uh, repositories have started to be built for publications. So um, this is, there's a load at, at the bottom is a, a European, um, it's a European um, research uh, repository. Um, and it itself has produced a whole pile of um, sub repositories where you can deposit data that um, publications that relate to your um, particular areas. So the one I've just put there is for Central America. So again, in ways, the publications themselves are not the entirely interesting thing, or not the only interesting thing, it's how they um, sort of are treated as a mass. And that's become kind of really fascinating. Because what has happened on top of that is people are building resources that mine this literature to, and, and query it so that you can then either decide whether what the answer to a particular question might be, or perhaps where you might need to go to do more research in the future. And so the one at the bottom, the one called SciFact is quite interesting because you can, you can um, query that to ask whether or not a fact that's been perhaps come out in the media has got any evidence base behind it. But there are also um, just sort of more simple ones where you can actually look at uh, just the recent research that's come out and uh, you can filter it down by where it's come from and even who the authors are. And the one that I'll just show you quickly is something called SciSight, which is the one in the middle. And what that does is sort of produce visual demonstrations of the publications and how they relate to each other. And I, I think personally, one of the most interesting things about all of this is the, the loss of the sense of smell that's come out of, uh, that's become a really um, important symptom of COVID-19. Um, and this, this sort of shows that it also relates to a whole set of other um, uh, symptoms and this this one is uh, how it relates to ataxia which is you know when you sort of have uh, sort of muscle problems so what we're seeing is that people really sort of almost the perfect example of people are no longer reading individual papers but they're sort of mining the literature as a whole to get to get more information coming out and this is just there's even more um, data sets that have been built on it by pretty much anyone who has had some sort of an interest in this and um, you know including things such as universities you know Johns Hopkins um, but all quite a lot of the publishers are also developing their own resources and so they're being studied as data so again this is a slide from Jessica Polka she showed it um, earlier this week um, and what we're seeing is that um, not only are the publications themselves you know as they're becoming data sets but the public the way that uh, this pandemic is evolving is changing the nature of the publications themselves and so we're seeing for example that preprints used to be uh, quite long um, they used to have very high reference counts and they used to sort of um, have um, come out as uh, just one single version but what we're seeing is that when you study this the, the kind of the the entirety of the data sets 
of publications for COVID-19 is they have a very different um, uh, characteristics compared with non-COVID preprints. And it actually suggests that what might be happening in the future is that this will drive change in, in preprints overall, I think. Um, but what's incredibly valuable is that you can harvest all of these publications and look at them um, as a whole. So I guess I think that what we've seen is that, you know, this has shown that publications are themselves data, that they require the same sort of um, uh, uh, characteristics attached to them that we have for data themselves. So as, as Paula mentioned earlier, the, the need for research to be fair and Roberto also mentioned that. So, you know, we need these have proper DOIs, they need to have ORCIDs so you can track them. They need to be in the open sites where we can find them in readable formats. You need to be able to link them properly together and obviously the licenses become incredibly important. Um, but the bad news, of course, is that actually this isn't going to last forever. And um, uh, for the, those of you that have, have missed this announcement, Elsevier has announced that they will be withdrawing uh, the right to use these the articles that they've published on the 31st of January. I don't know if they kind of have decided that the pandemic will be over by then. But um, what, what it does show is that we can't take these, grant, these rights for granted. And so there is a really important underlying principle here, which is that we have to assume that um, publications, unless explicitly stated as being open forever, actually may well be locked down at any particular time. And, and I think we're going to see some really interesting um, uh, fights over, this, you know, over the next few months. So I'll just finish by saying, I think that, you know, what can we take from this? I think that the publications themselves are valuable data and you can derive insights from them that we never really imagined were possible when you're looking at individual papers. That free for now is definitely not enough and we should be pushing um, all everyone who's publishing to, to do better and to think about that and particularly the publishers um, and particularly in Open Access Week. And, you know, when we think about, you know, open with purpose, I can't think of anything more valuable than having research that's open during a pandemic to demonstrate the value of that, um, that idea. Um, and then obviously open and fair is a fundamental property for and of research. So not just of the papers themselves or the data within them, but actually the publications. Um, yeah, so happy to follow up. Um, and I'll just uh, put a little bit of a um, plug in for other events that we're doing with the Open Access Strategy Group, which are all listed on the website at the bottom there. Uh, we've got, we've had a few events this week already and we've got uh, four more coming up on Thursday and Friday. I'll stop there. Any questions for Ginny? No, it doesn't look like it. So thank you, everyone. I'd like to uh, encourage you all, and I'll just share my screen as well. Um, I'd like to encourage you all to check out Research Data Finder, QT's open data repository. Uh, this is where students and staff can publish and share their research data. Uh, as an example, Kelly Wilson-Stewart, who is a high degree research student in the Science and Engineering faculty, she just won the International Visualize Your Thesis competition with her entry, Protecting Nurses from Radiation Exposure. Um, and she has uh, a few, last year, uh, uploaded her data to Research Data Finder and here it is here, occupational head dose levels during coronary angiography. So um, this is, uh, there are multiple uh, data sets in here, uh, a couple of hundred actually, um, and if you were interested in looking at her data set as an example, uh, here they are freely available or openly available here. Okay, uh, I'd also just like to finish up the afternoon by thanking all of our speakers for their presentations. Thank you everyone. And if no one else has any questions, we might uh, wrap it up there. Thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon and happy Open Access Week.